Hello. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Good. Um, let me th see. I suppose you can see my screen. Yes. Okay, very good. So today we are going to talk about uh, some of these topics. Uh, and uh, one of which is uh, homomorphism of waveguides in transmission lines. We have studied rectangular waveguides. Um, and before that, we studied. Uh, plane wave reflection from interfaces, um, where we show that um, if you do have a simple interface, uh, such as this one, and then you have plane wave uh, interface. And we show that this problem can be mapped to a transmission line problem. Okay, it can be mapped to this transmission line problem and we established uh, homomorphism with transmission line equation. Okay, then we went ahead and did the waveguide problem uh, what we want to show is that the waveguide problem can also be made to be homomorphic uh, problem in a sense that uh, if this is in free space or homogeneous medium, you can show that each section can be replaced by a transmission line equivalence. So you can say that this is equivalent to uh, different sections of transmission lines. 
and then an infinite long transmission line such as this one. But it turns out that if you have wave, okay, so if I have wave guides, and this is the side view of something, and if you look from this side, this might look like a rectangular wave type, for instance. Okay, or if you look at this side, it can also be a circular wave guide. And if this circular wave guide is filled with uh, materials, layered materials, and then if you send a mode into this wave guide, it will bounce off and it will bounce medium in a homogeneous medium, okay? So we're going to talk about this homomorphism today. And we start with the TE case. In the TE case, we know that um, in the waveguide HZ is not equal to zero, EZ equal to zero. That is what the definition of TE is. And then we can start with Maxwell's equation saying that curl of H is equal to J omega epsilon E. The goal is to derive the telegraphist equation or something similar to the telegraphist equation for the equations in the waveguide. Okay, so we're going to assume source free since it's going to be a waveguide problem. And we like to break the Dell operator into two parts, that the Dell operator actually consists of a transverse part plus a longitudinal part, where the transverse part is the transverse Dell operator or the 2D Dell operator. Okay, it can be written as such. And then the longitudinal part is just this part. The Dell operator can be easily broken into these two parts. And then we can also do the same for a magnetic field. Can be broken up into a transverse part plus a longitudinal part. This will be something like H X H X plus Y H Y, for instance. And we can do likewise to the electric field it will be broken up into a transverse part plus a longitudinal part, okay? Now what you need to do then is to plug them into Maxwell's equations and see if you can arrive at simpler equations. And with those simpler equations, maybe we can identify something close to being the telegraphist equation. So we're going to do separate terms you see that curl of H now with that decomposition can be written as the transverse part plus the longitudinal part curl with H, which consists of the transverse part plus the longitudinal part. And all this should be equal to J omega epsilon E, okay? Which again would be J omega epsilon E sub S plus E sub Z. And now we will expand the left-hand side and using the distributive law, it will consist of four terms. If you take the curl of this with that, you have a term that looks like this, where the law of a distributive algebra. And then you will have a term that looks like this. It could be this one crossing with that one. And then you have a term that is this term crossing with HZ. This is what you have on the left-hand side, but what happens to the curve Z cross with HZ term? What do you think happens to this term? The support term that I didn't write down, but what do you think would happen to this term? Something pointing in the Z direction, crossing with a magnetic field that points in the Z direction. That should go to zero. Very good, this goes to zero, okay? So I can just ignore it. So left-hand side only has three terms. And by so doing, um, I can know that this term, okay, consists of terms that have X and Y component. This term would also consist of terms with X and Y component. 
And if they cross with each other, if this DAO operator, if you just, uh, just do the vector algebra, long hand instead of uh, short hand, uh, where would the final vector point to us? The first term on the left hand side, would it point in X, Y direction or would it point in certain special direction? Anybody, the first term on the left hand side, where would it point? If you go through the Z direction, and you'll hate. the LS is something that has uh, the transverse component. Okay, HS is just something that has transverse components as well. And if you take the cross product of these two terms, where do you think this vector would point? The Z direction. Anybody? Well, uh, maybe if I write it out more explicitly, it will be clearer. It would be something like this, plus something like that, crossing with x, h, x, plus y, h, y. And you can do distributive algebra again. Okay, you cross this term with that term, that will give you zero. This term will give you something that points in the z direction, then you think so. If s cross y gives you z, and then y cross x give you minus z, and then y cross y give you zero. Okay, so the final thing would point in the, what direction does that point to? Anybody? The z direction. Very good. Okay, so this is equal to z hat, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so the rest of the term, if we go through the same reasoning, this will point in the transverse direction. It will not point in the z direction. Okay, so immediately you can say that the first term equates to this term on the right hand side. The second and the third term equates to this term on the right hand side. So we have a simplified equation. This must be true. plus j omega epsilon e sub s. And then I would neglect to write down the other term because it's not important at this point. Okay. Uh, my goal is to get something that looks like the telegraphist equation out. Okay. So, so have this equation and in this, this equation here have some semblance of the telegraphist equation because I know that there's a partial partial z here buried in this equation. The telegraphist equation looks something like partial partial z times i is equal to minus j omega l v. Okay, maybe I can uh, put my hope on this term that part of the telegraphist equation will come from that. Okay, uh, I would like to get rid of this term or not get rid of it, so express it some, as some other terms. Okay, HZ is no good. I, I don't want to work with HZ. So in order to express HZ in terms of other terms, I use the other Maxwell's equation, curl of E is minus J omega mu H. Okay, and then let me assume that I have TE modes in the waveguide first. Okay, let me deal with the case where the modes are TE. To make life simpler, I can again decompose the left hand side as to as uh, grad Z cross with ES plus EZ is equal to J omega mu HS plus HC. Okay, and then I can again break this into four terms. And there would be one term of these four terms. There'll be one term that points in the z direction. And this must be true. Okay. If I pick the first term of the four expansion, I have this equation here. This equation allows me to remove, not remove, but express hz in terms of some other quantities. Okay. So I can use this to express HZ here in terms of some other quantities. And by so doing, I will have a new equation that will get closer to what I want, which is the telegraphist equation. 
So if I look at this previous equation that I have derived, uh, which is over here, okay, I want to express this in terms of some other things. Then finally, this equation will become something that looks like partials, the grad Z cross with HS, and then plus the second term, which is this one. I'm going to express my HC in terms of this expression over here. So it will look like something like one over J omega mu uh, with a minus sign out front, curl S cross ES. Uh, is equal to j omega epsilon e sub s. Okay, still doesn't look quite like the telegraphist equation yet, but I will get there eventually. Um, I'm going to use the back of the cap formula to simplify this, or using the fact that if I apply the back of the cap formula, this double curl in two dimension, this is actually in two dimension, they are vectors. Okay, and this can be written as gradient of the transverse divergence of ES uh, minus ES. Okay, I think by, by now you should be quite familiar with this identity. We use this identity over and over, over again. The only difference here is that this DLS is not the full DL. DLS is only the partial DL, the transverse DL. Okay, but nevertheless, you can still apply the identity in the back of the cap formula and arrive at something that looks like this. But there is something here that I like to say, which is that I like to say that this term equals zero. Okay, we are dealing with a source-free case. And if the waveguide is source-free, we know that this is true. Okay, but we are dealing with the TE case. If TE case is being considered here, then EZ equal to zero. Then divergence of, let me see, why, why is this thing? Oh, this thing is here. I can move this thing somewhere else, can I? Um, busy doing something, I don't know what it's trying to do. Let me see, you can move it somewhere. It's busy doing something. Let's wait a little while until my computer wakes up from doing something busy. I want to move this. Uh, let me see. Refuse to let me move. Uh, it goes into a sleep mode again. I'm not very good with computers. Um, what is it trying to do? Well, it refuses to move away. I don't know how to move it away, so uh, just let it be then. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can you see that this thing is blocking your view? Yes. yes. There's, there's a bar on the screen. Yeah. And then it's not going to be moved. It refuses to be moved. Let me click here. It doesn't move either. But uh, let me see uh, what can I do. So it blocks the screen and they can't move it. Hmm. Anybody very good with computers can tell me what to do with this thing? If not, I just let it be there then. Uh, okay, so EZ equals zero. Then it's quite clear that divergence of E will be the transverse divergence of ES. This is true because EZ is equal to zero. And this has to be zero which means that this has to be zero, okay? So the double call becomes 
something simpler. And finally, I will have an equation that says that uh, um, I have an equation that says that double curl actually becomes the Laplacian of E sub S. But we know that this is an empty, empty waveguide. And since it's an empty waveguide, you can easily show that the electric field inside satisfies this equation. I think we have gone through this derivation many times over. And from this, you can show that you can get this equation. Okay, using the fact that double curl can be re uh, replaced by that. And then since we only have ES, okay, E is only ES. Okay, there's no uh, Z values there. So I know that then uh, this double Laplacian, okay, double Laplacian uh, is equal to, uh, Laplacian square plus partial square partial z square es. Is this clear that the Laplacian, which is partial square partial x square plus partial square partial y square plus partial square partial z square can be written as a transverse Laplacian plus this partial square partial z square. And hence I can use that to replace this transverse Laplacian here and saying that uh, this should be zero. And then, so what I have from this equation is that uh, this equation becomes uh, transverse Laplacian plus beta squared plus partial square partial Z squared because the Laplacian becomes this, okay? E S must be zero, E is E X, okay? This is no easy component. So, but what is partial square, partial z square? Assuming that we have a waveguide mode in this waveguide, then partial square, partial z square just becomes uh, um, minus beta z square. So I would have uh, transverse Laplacian plus this uh, transverse number E S equal to zero, where I have done a quick substitution that this is equal to the total beta minus beta z squared. Okay, I just have made use of this substitution. And by doing that, I can simplify this. I can say that the transverse Laplacian is just minus beta s squared. Hence, this term can be uh, replaced with beta, uh, beta s squared E S. Okay beta s squared e s. And then let's see if we get something simpler. So this term here, which looks very, very difficult, eventually becomes something quite simple. And, and I can write this equation that I have on the top of the page with this simpler one. Uh, the left-hand side is just the first term is equal to that. And then I would move whatever that is very complicated to the right-hand side, keeping this on the right-hand side. And then that term that eventually uh, becomes simplified will become beta S square over uh, J omega mu. E sub S, okay, I'm going to I'm going to take this term, replace the double curl operator and simplify that until it becomes that simple. And then divide it by J omega and move it to the right hand side. Let me see if it allows me to move it now. Still doesn't allow me to move it. Let me see if we can shrink it. Well, it doesn't allow me to shrink it either. Let me. Um, yes. Professor, when you when you change slides, it goes away on RM because I think you're only sharing your PowerPoint technically. So 
I think it's only obstructing your view. But for oh. us, when you change slides, it, it goes away. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. So it's still obstructing my view, but not your view. Uh, very strange. Uh, let me see. You can try changing a different screen, sharing a different setting. So sharing a whole screen or something else. Stop yeah. share and share again. Yeah. See if it goes away. Let me stop share. Well, nothing is happening. Zoom message is not responding. Wow. Wait for the thing to respond. It's not very good. Things are very slow. I don't know why. Okay, I have good signal. Um, it wouldn't allow me to stop share. Well, it wouldn't allow me to stop share either, so I better go back. I better go back and work with whatever I have. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Okay, good. I, I have a small blockage on my side, but not your side, okay? So I have this equation. Uh, thank you for responding. So I have this equation, I can consolidate the two terms and write it as J omega epsilon. I have... Uh, your screen is gone. Yeah, something is happening. I, I don't know. I think what there's a very long lag from when you tried to stop sharing. So I think this is what you tried to do yeah, um, it was 30 seconds ago. Right, it, long lag on your. Computer. It is a long lag. Um, it's not share, uh, stopping. Maybe it's stopping to do now. But I have a hourglass sign on my screen, which means that I just have to wait. Um, why does it do that? Why does this hourglass sign comes on? Okay, yeah, it went away. So let me share my screen again. Well, the hourglass sign uh, comes on again. Um, what does that mean? You cannot see my screen, I suppose. No, we cannot. Okay, it says Zoom meeting not responding. I just have this hourglass thing going on. Um, I don't know how many you are good with Zoom. If I press the end button, would I be able to come back to you? It gives me an option of closing the program and say if I close the program, okay. It seems that it gives me a different screen now. Whenever I try to share, it gives me the, the hour button again. Um, it gives me the hour.
No, I don't know what is happening. Um, yeah. I just get this hourglass thing on my screen and nothing happens. Uh, I'm almost tempted to abort Zoom and resume it again. Let me see if that one. Well, are you all still there? Yes, we are still here. If I you... see a, a blank screen on my side. I believe if you exit the meeting, we should be able to re-enter with the same link that you sent us. If not, okay. uh, just send another link. Okay, let me close the program. Are you still there? Yes, it look, we could see you now. Okay, I, I don't know, something just hangs on this side. Let me uh, share screen again. Okay, uh, let me see, share screen. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, let me string this. Let me move this away. Now this thing allows me to move the blockage away. Let me move it to this side. Okay. So after that, you can consolidate this thing on the right hand side and write it as uh, something like this. Okay. One minus beta S square over beta square. Okay. You can rewrite things. It's just uh, quite straightforward algebra. And what happens is that I'm going to skip a little bit of steps since I lost some time. And the right-hand side can be written in terms of a cosine, just as we did for the plane wave in layered medium case. So finally, this equation can be written as uh, epsilon cosine square theta E1 or ES, okay? Where uh, cosine theta is defined to be this way, define beta z to be beta square cosine theta, then beta s square is beta square minus beta z square, and then that is the angle cosine theta, very similar to what we saw in the plane wave case. Then I'm going to write the left-hand side explicitly, and then I'm going to get something like partial partial z, z cross hs. Okay, but write this DLS operator, and then I would have ES, okay? Um, then I'm going to do the same to find the other telegraphers equation. I almost have one telegraphers equation ready for me, okay? I'm going to find the other one. The other one comes from the second Maxwell's equation. That curl of E is equal to J omega mu H. Okay, and then if I were to equate the z component of this or the, the, the transverse component of this equation, I would get something like uh, ES. Okay, there's no EZ because this is TE. I would get this equation and again, I assume that EZ equal to zero because I'm looking at the TE modes. And then I can get the other telegraphers equation from this one, which is partial partial z, z cross e s is equal to j omega mu h s. Okay, then I'm going to make this look like the transmission line uh, telegraphers equation. And what I need to do is actually to take this equation and cross it with z. And if I do that, then uh, the second equation really does look like a telegraphist equation because this will be partial partial z e s z cross z is minus one. Okay, so this will be something like j omega mu h s. So this pair, this equation pair, okay, 
sorry, because I Z cross with something, then I should have a Z cross on the right hand side. This pair, this equation, in tandem with this equation, make them look like the telegraphist equation pair. So I just have to do the substitution. Okay. I just have to do the substitution that I let ES be equivalent to my V, my voltage. And then if I let uh, Z cross H S be equivalent to my current. And then I will see that one of these two equations, like the first equation would look like the telegraphic equation. Okay. Minus J omega C V. Well, you can identify your C uh, to be something like epsilon cosine squared theta. Okay, to be equivalent to that. And then you can also make that your mu, in the second equation, the mu looks like your inductor, your line inductors. And then you can actually say that the characteristic impedance of the transmission line equivalence is just equal to that, will be equal to mu over epsilon cosine squared theta, and that would become omega mu over beta z. Okay. So you can see that the equations of a waveguide can be made homomorphic or analogous to the equation of the transmission line or the telegraphic equation. So whatever techniques you have learned in transmission line theory, you can apply to the TE modes. This is for TE modes, okay? And you repeat the same for TM mode. And you get the TM modes, another set of telegraphic equations, okay, which I'm not going to do here. But the moral of the story is that uh, if you have a very complicated waveguide, such as this one we have over here, okay, you can put it over here. For clar clarity, okay. This waveguide with different sections. Um, no, I don't want this. Thank you. Uh, so this waveguide with different sections uh, can be met to a transmission line problem, and you can solve this waveguide problems. Uh, using transmission line techniques like space charts and so on. What is more important is that if I have a multi-section waveguide, say each of this is a rectangular waveguide and they're concatenated together uh, to make into a very complicated microwave engineering circuit. You can replace each of this section with a transmission line. Okay, so it's almost tempting to think that, well, uh, in the first problem over here, uh, I can replace each with a transmission line. Okay. And so on. I can solve the above problem using whatever transmission line techniques I have learned. And over here in the transmission line theory, I know that V and I are continuous at junction. Okay, and if you go back and look at the equations again, V and I being continuous just means that HS is continuous, ES is continuous, if I is continuous, tangential H is continuous, if V is continuous, tangential E is continuous across a junction. So this is fine and dainty, everything is good. Replace with transmission line, and then they solve this transmission line problem, all the voltages are guaranteed to be continuous at this junction and all the currents are also guaranteed to be continuous at this junction. But if you're more ambitious, and if you want to use transmission line theory to solve a waveguide problem such as this that you might encounter in microwave engineering, you can clearly see that uh, tangential E is not continuous across this junction, neither is tangential H, because this junction is very, very complicated, okay? 
So we can not truly replace this with a transmission line problem. Okay, however, we, if you're clever, we can do something. Say if we have a simple junction such as this one, we cannot truly replace this with a transmission line problem like this. Because transmission lines say V and I continuous. But here, ES and HS not continuous because of all this very ugly junction on this side. You might even have diaphragms. Some microwave engineers will be kind of have a sense of humor. They will make junctions where you put in these nice things called diaphragm. I'm not sure if I spelled diaphragm correctly. Maybe it's spelled like this, di diaphragm, okay? Um, so, and then the current will be induced on these diaphragms to give rise to inductive and capacitive effects. And the junction cannot be modeled very simply. However, microwave engineers are clever. So in the event that the currents are not continuous, um, they replace them with such a model that they put inductors and capacitors at the junction so that V1 is not equal to V2, I1 is not equal to I2. And you put in simple lumped element at the junction to account for the fact that the current and the voltage are not continuous. And yet with this, you can use transmission line theory and Smith's chart to solve this rather complicated looking uh, waveguide problem or multi-junction waveguide problem. Okay, now, any questions so far? So you can see that transmission lines are very powerful. They can be used to solve a whole slew of problems involving many, many uh, things that you encounter in microwave engineering. And the next thing I'd like to talk about is actually microwave resonators or cavity resonators. Uh, it's not only used in microwave, it also is used in optics because even in optics, uh, resonators are very important. So let's look at the simplest concept of the resonator that we have learned. The simplest concept of the resonator that you have learned is probably this one over here. Okay, LC tank circuit. And this thing resonates. The good thing about it is that it has a self-sustaining uh, self solution even when uh, there's no driving source. Of course, you would drive it with a source you can get the current and the voltage to be infinitely large, okay? And of course, usually there is some kind of a loss. Okay, there's some kind of a loss. Uh, there might be certain uh, dip uh, dissipative loss. And one obvious thing that you can use a resonator for is actually to use it as a filter. If any one of you have played with radio circuits when you were young, Okay, uh, this is a good filter because only a certain radio frequency uh, satisfies the condition of resonance of this LC tank circuit that it becomes an open circuit so the current will drop its power into the load and you can make this into a good uh, radio receiver receiving the radio station that you like to receive by picking the LC tank circuit. So let's figure out how to make resonators, not with LC tank circuits, but with microwave circuits or transmission lines. The easiest resonator that you can make using transmission line is such as this one, okay? You can actually think of this as a resonator, but you can also terminate it with uh, impedances at the two ends. Let's call this the impedance at the source end and then in the other end, you can put it with the impedance at the load end. And if you have a transmission line such as this one over here, okay, uh, it will have a reflection coefficient at this end. And then at the other end, it will have a reflection coefficient gamma sub s. 
And we can easily write down the transverse resonance condition and say that the resonance solution would only exist if this equation is satisfied, which is 2j beta z d. Assuming that the wave number on this transmission line is beta z and then d is the length. Okay. Any problem with this trans, uh, transverse resonance condition? So we can actually write down the resonance requirement of a resonator quite easily in transmission line theory. And of course, you can specialize this uh, to different kinds of resonators. For instance, if I were to replace this resonator with open circuits at the both ends, okay? What is gamma S and gamma L for this? Anybody? What is gamma S and gamma L for this resonator? at the two ends, if you still remember your transmission line theory. What is gamma S? Anybody? When you have an open circuit, what happens to the reflection coefficient? Does it become zero or does it become one? Well, I still have 14 people in the class, so I have not lost a lot of people. It so what is the reflection? One. It should become one, very good, okay? Similarly, on this end, the reflection coefficient is also one, okay? So the resonance condition is just this. Okay, because both the reflection coefficients are one. And, and um, another case is uh, when you have two shorts, they put shorts at both ends. Okay, gamma s equals to minus one, gamma load equals to minus one, and you can still get the same equation because gamma s is minus one, gamma l is minus one. You get the same resonance condition. The reason why they have the same resonance condition is that if you were to think about the current on this transmission line, when you are, have resonance, the current must look something like this. It must go to zero at both ends. So it resonates at half a wavelength. That means if you pick the frequency right, if the wavelength is half the size of the transmission line, or the size of the transmission line is half the wavelength, then this thing will start to radiate. And similarly, if you look at the voltage, uh, that is the current, okay, that's the current. And if I look at the voltage on this, uh, the current on this transmission line, it should be maximum at the two ends. So the current looks something like this, okay? And over here, the, the, the voltage looks something like this. Uh, no, not very, not very nicely drawn, okay? The, the voltage looks the other way around, okay? So this is the current. And see that they both resonate at half a wavelength. However, if I can do something clever, I put a short at one end and put an open at the other end. Uh, how would the current distribution look like um, if I were have to have this structure? The current distribution will look something like this, right? zero at this end and then it builds up to the maximum where you have a short. So this thing will resonate at the quarter wavelength using resonate test half a wavelength. This one resonates at half a wavelength. You can very easily see that, okay? At half a wavelength, these things will resonate on the left, but at the quarter wavelength, the thing will resonate um, on the right. And which one would you like better? The one that resonates at quarter wavelengths or the one that resonates at half a wavelength? Anybody? Which one would you like better? And usually quarter wavelength. Quarter wavelength, right? Because we all like small things. Small things are cute, okay? So you don't want to carry a half lambda resonator around, especially if you're dealing with uh, very low frequency things. You like to carry small things around, okay? All the resonators that you have in your cell phones, you'll find that they're all quarter wavelength uh, resonators instead of half wavelength resonators, okay? So, uh, this is just a picture I've drawn previously, and uh, let's see how we can how we can make a make a quarter wavelength resonator. 
you put a shot at one end, you put an open circuit at the other end, okay? However, if you have an open circuit at the other end, things are not truly that way, that way in the real world, okay? What happens is that if something is open circuit, it never is truly an open circuit in the real world because the current, you will expect the current to be maximum here and then go to zero here, right? If it's open circuit, no current can flow. But then it doesn't happen that way because there'll be charges built up at this end of the, of the transmission line. Those charges give rise to fringing field. Okay, the, the electric field will look something like this. So you have electric field oozing out of the end of the transmission line. And what do this electric field do? What kind of current do they carry? The electric field carries some sort of a current through free space or through vacuum. What kind of current? Displacement. Uh, what? Displacement. Very good. Displacement current. Okay, wonderful. Displacement current. So the current does not actually go to zero abruptly. The current goes to zero and then maybe something like this. Okay. And it comes from the fact that there are displacement currents flowing at the end of the line, so the current is not something that goes to zero abruptly, but becoming something that's non-zero, and then the carries into the current, into the capacitor, and the current distribution is like, like that. So these are called the fringing field capacitors. You have to add them into your your transmission line model. Otherwise, your model would not be complete. Okay, just something that you have to bear in mind when you do microwave engineering. Fringing fields are everywhere. They're very hard to, to control. Okay, you, we don't have the liberty of controlling them that well. Because electric charges are everywhere. Okay, so, so let's go and look at other kinds of resonators. We have seen how to make resonators uh, using uh, simple transmission line. What happens if you want to build resonators with other kinds of uh, microwave components like a waveguide? Okay, we can think likewise that uh, what happens if I have a rectangular waveguide? I can make uh, one side short circuited by putting a short there and then they can make one side open in this rectangular waveguide. Then it is more or less, as we say before, there's a homomorphism between transmission line theory and waveguide theory. So we can say that this geometry is more or less homomorphic to this geometry. Uh, however, be careful because you have a lot of fringing field at this other end. So the correct model should be one with the capacitance at the end fringing field capacitor. Okay, I'm going to describe this heuristically. Okay, so, so however, a short is a lot easier to make than uh, open. So if I were to put a, a rectangular waveguide, if I put a short at both ends, put a short here, then there's no fringing field, and you can actually write down the solution for this cavity quite easily. Uh, if you were to write down the transmission line equivalent, it would be a transmission line with shorts on both ends. And that we know how to do. The resonant frequency of the transmission line is quite easy to do. And um, it would be something like, um, uh, this thing has to be a, lambda over two times integer values. Okay, as long as this length is uh, lambda over two, uh, lambda is in the z direction over two, okay, times integer values, then you can make this into a resonance cavity. So beta z for this uh, waveguide is given by beta square minus uh, beta s square and you remember what beta s squared for a rectangular waveguide is? It is beta s squared minus n 
let me see what notation I use. I use m, okay, m pi over a square minus n pi over b squared. Remember that? Beta s is equal to that. One of this is beta x squared. The other one is beta y squared. Beta s is beta x squared plus beta y squared. Remember that? Uh, when you did the rectangular waveguide, we have those as the dispersion relationship. And then you can put this with a short circuit model and then the if this wave is having a a wave number propagating in that manner then the other condition is that beta z d has to be n pi okay this beta z the wavelength the wave number in the z direction times the d must be integer of pi or p pi as i use in the notes here so what happens then is that beta square, okay, if I put beta z in there and, and square this equation, I will have beta square is beta z square plus m pi over a square plus m pi over b square. Okay, beta z can be p pi over d square. Okay, so this equation means that beta square, uh, let me see. I, I should use the next slide to write this equation then since I'm running out of space. Okay, so if I write beta z equals to this over here, finally I have beta square, which is omega square mu epsilon, is equal to uh, pi over 2d square. Uh, let me see. It should be p pi over d square plus m pi over a square plus uh, n pi over b square. This is essentially beta z square, beta x square, beta y square. Okay, but beta z square, as we said before, is p pi over, over d. Okay, because it has to fit into half a wavelength at least of integer multiple thereof. And this equation says that you can only have a solution at certain select frequency. Solutions are not possible at all frequencies. Only certain select frequencies would you get the solution. Those are called the resonant frequencies. Okay, are there any questions so far? So I can make a rectangular waveguide into a cavity by terminating it at both ends with the shore. And if I terminate the rectangular waveguide at both ends with the shore, I can use a very simple transmission line model, okay, to figure out what, uh, what beta z should be. Okay, if I want the current to go to zero at both ends, uh, beta z has to be something of this form, okay? And then with the knowledge of what beta z should be, I can write down the resonance condition. This is not the guidance condition now, this is the resonance condition. At only select frequency can this condition be satisfied because you will fix the dimension of A, you fix the dimension of B, you fix the dimension of D, and then you choose the modes to have certain indices, M, N, and P, okay? This is called the T, uh, either T, E, M, N, P, or T, M, M, N, P modes, okay? Any, any questions so far? Any questions? No questions, very good. No questions. Then let's, talk about how we should find the resonant frequency of such a complicated structure. And we say this problem is homomorphic to a transmission line problem. You can replace this with the transmission line here, transmission line here, transmission line here, transmission line here, and then put a short at the end and then connect them. And then there is a transmission line in the center section here. And then you put transmission line here transmission line here, transmission line here, and then put a short there. And I can easily write down the 
transverse resonance condition for this uh, structure using the transmission line model or using the generalized reflection coefficient model. It is actually very similar to the layered medium problem and you can easily show that the transverse resonance co uh, condition is the product of the uh, generalized reflection coefficient to the left and to the right times the beta z of the center section and this has to be one okay and as long as the condition is satisfied you would be able to have a resonance solution which is the resonance frequency of this structure okay any questions so far okay very good so you actually have the big picture as to what you can do uh, to find the resonant frequency of some rather complicated structure so let's look at some very simple structures then uh, that of the rectangular cavity again so we go back and and visit the rectangular cavity again and i like to make my cavity as small as i can again uh, things that are small are cute okay you don't want to carry uh, big cavities around say if you are working with very low frequency microwave uh, if something is half a lambda or or a quarter lambda large they're quite large so you like to find ways to design cavities that are very small okay cavities are good because as i said before they can be used as a filter and if you had worked with uh, crystal uh, crystal radio circuit when you were young I, I don't know if you ever work with that but if you attach an antenna and then if you um let me see how, how do they do that uh i guess you put a diode and then uh and then you put a resonant circuit here okay you put your earphone here which acting like a load and then you put your ground on the other side this this can act like a very simple radio receiver okay this is the antenna and you can tune this with the variable capacitor so that this thing would only receive the radio station that you like to receive so a resonator can be used as a filter that's what i'm trying to get at and so what we can do then is actually uh, wanting to design a cavity that is a good resonator which maybe i can use as a filter but let me look at the rectangular waveguide or the circular waveguide or any cylindrical waveguide let me move this away so that it can okay so let me look at the cylindrical waveguide and, and let's look at the beta z equal to zero case if i have a waveguide what does beta z equal to zero means let's assume that this is the z axis okay what does beta z equal to zero mean to you what does it mean if i have a wave propagating in this waveguide it propagates in both directions okay in this manner plus z and negative z direction what does beta z equals zero mean to you anybody uh, it will be resonance uh yeah you're almost correct but uh what happens to this mode if beta z equal to zero what does it what happens to it on uh, just standing wave uh, right this wave okay we we have this notion that if you have a waveguide mode it actually corresponds to a wave that bounces around the waveguide okay and also bounce around in the other direction that is the physical picture of what a waveguide mode is and when beta z is not equal to zero okay this mode is actually uh, bouncing around like a circle okay it moves or moves in certain direction okay when beta z is not equal to zero it bounces around but it moves forward 
okay, it has a phase velocity in the z direction. When beta z equal to zero, it just bounces around without moving out of the taper. Can you, can you envision such a mode? The mode just bounces around in the x and y direction, but doesn't move out of the taper. Can you envision such a mode? That is what beta z equal to zero means, okay? So beta z is equal to beta square minus beta x square minus beta y square. And if you choose your, your frequency properly, if you choose the frequency properly, because this is n pi over a square for rectangular waveguide, uh, minus n pi over b square for the rectangular waveguide. If you choose your resonant frequency, you can always make beta z equal to zero. When beta z equal to zero, this wave does not propagate in the z direction anymore. Can you see that? It refuses to propagate and move forward in the z direction. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, I see. At least somebody say yes, okay? So if this mode doesn't move in the z direction, uh, how is it supposed to look like? Uh, let me see if I insert the new slide. Okay, so there are two possibilities. The, there's no, no z variation in the mode, okay, because beta z equal to zero. And there are two ways that the mode can, 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 uh, can behave like that. One is that the, the electric field is constant. E is good to E zero, okay? And then this mode will just bounce around. Bounce around like this, okay? If the electric field is like that, because partial partial z has to be zero. So you can show that E only has one component like this. That is one possibility. So is this the TE mode or TM mode? EZ not equal to zero. What mode is this? What mode did you see inside the waveguide? It has no HZ. This is the TM mode, right? Okay. So there's another possibility. This is E field. Another possibility is that um, you only have magnetic field inside. H H is Z H naught. Okay. This will be the TE mode. Agree? And this mode again will bounce around in the rectangle on the four walls of the waveguide and it doesn't move forward in the z direction. Can you see that? Okay. So of these two modes, uh, now I'm assuming that these two waveguides will be infinitely long so they can exist. But what happens if we start to put end caps? on these two waveguides. I put this uh, PEC cap on this side and put a PEC cap on this side, okay? With the electric field being aligned in that manner, uh, would the boundary condition be satisfied? PEC, what is the boundary condition for a PEC for electric field? It shouldn't have any tangential component. Since the electric field inside the waveguide is something of this form, I would not violate the boundary condition if I close these two waveguides with two PEC walls, or if I short circuit the two ends of the waveguide. Agree? Can you see that? Uh, could you clarify this a little bit? Okay, so I have argued that if you have beta z equal to zero case for this waveguide, the wave doesn't propagate in the z direction anymore. Since e to the j beta z, z is equal to one, the wave doesn't propagate in the z direction. So the wave just bounces around in the four 
walls of the waveguide with no propagation in the z direction. Okay, and if you think about it, how can this happen? This could happen if the wave just uh, is pointing with the electric field in a z direction and it just bounces around on the four walls of the waveguide. Can you see that the electric field inside this waveguide would be something of this form? Yes. Okay, very good. You can see that the electric field is something of that form. You can actually convince yourself quite easily by, by looking at Maxwell's equations, but I don't have time to do that and convince you through Maxwell's equation that this actually is a solution, okay? This is actually a solution to Maxwell's equation. Uh, then now, if I have this electric field already inside my infinitely long waveguide, okay, and if I start to put PEC walls on both sides of this uh, cavity, the, the front side and the back side, uh, would I be able to put in those PEC walls? Would the boundary condition be violated if I start to move my PEC wall onto the two end caps of the waveguide? What is the boundary condition on the PEC wall? n cross e equal to zero, right? But the original field I have in the waveguide has no n cross e, no tangential e field. So I can safely cap these two waveguides, two ends with PEC walls without violating the boundary condition. Agree? Oh yeah, now it's clear. Yeah, I okay, see. Good. Oh, and then once, after I cap the two ends, then the wave will still keep bouncing around inside the waveguide. Can you envision that? It will keep bouncing around in the waveguide because boundary conditions is not violated. Boundary conditions is still satisfied. Okay. So if you have a TMMN mode, finally, it becomes a TMMN zero mode. If I put in the end caps on the both ends of the waveguide. Can you see that? Because there's no Z variation, this is a P index. Okay, P index is equal to zero because if I look at my transmission line model, uh, then if I were to put in the third dimension, my, my P index is zero because there's no Z variation on this transmission line, okay? However, if I have this TE mode, the magnetic field was pointing like that inside the waveguide. What happens if they put a PEC wall on this side and that side? Would the magnetic field be able to satisfy the boundary condition on the PEC walls? What is the boundary condition for magnetic field on the PEC wall? Do you remember? It is actually n dot b, n dot h must be zero on PEC wall. And so what happens then is that if you were to end cap these two ends with PEC walls, the TE modes will be eliminated from the inside because they cannot satisfy the boundary condition. Okay, so a TE mode with beta z equal to zero, which is constant inside the waveguide, cannot be end capped with PEC walls on the both side. It will just completely eliminate this mode. So the lowest mode is actually this mode. The mode with the lowest resonant frequency is this mode, okay? Where the electric field is pointing in the Z direction, you put end caps on both ends, the wave still bounces around. And if you take a top view of the uh, electromagnetic field, the electric field looks something like that. And then magnetic field goes like that. This is called the TM, 110 mode. Okay, and this mode is the mode with the lowest resonant frequency. And it's the desirable mode if you want to make a cavity resonator out of a rectangular waveguide. Okay, so, so, so you can read more about this. I'm going, I'm going to, I just give the heuristic derivation of this uh, physics behind this but you can also do it more mathematically. 
uh, which is more sure-footed for many of us. So if you don't feel comfortable with this argument, uh, you can go and look at the mathematical uh, justification for this argument. And you can also say that this generalization can be used for circular cavities. Okay, you end cap both sides. There will be a resonant modes inside where the wave just bounces around the wall of the uh, waveguide and that will be a TM mode of some sort, okay? And I'm just going to talk about applications of cavity resonators now. So you can have a cavity and when it resonates, you know one thing that happens. What happens to the current and the voltage in an LC tank circuit when it resonates? Well, if you go back to your LC tank circuit again, um, so let's see, do I have it here? You go back to your LC tank circuit, you know that, well, the current and the voltage becomes very high. Okay, the current on the circuit becomes very high because of resonance. That is what happens when something is resonating. Just like if you go to the park and sit on the swing and swing along with the resonant frequency of the swing, the swing will swing higher and higher. And so if you have an antenna connected, this is the radiating antenna connected to a cavity resonator. And if you inject microwave energy at the resonant frequency of the cavity, it will build up energy inside this cavity. And that energy would give rise to good radiation efficiency of this antenna. And you can also make uh, resonators out of uh, microstrip lines. For instance, if you have a microstrip line like this, okay, you can chop it off at both ends. And this looks like a open circuited transmission line at two ends and it will resonate when this is about half a wavelength long. Okay. And then you can use that to couple to other microstrip lines and make resonators. Of course, you will have to put in fringing field capacitors. You will have to put in coupling capacitors. And you can do quite a bit of nice uh, microwave engineering with this kind of structure. Here's another design. This is, this is almost like an astral drawing. You can see this speaker two ways, okay, depending on how your mind uh, look at this picture. So it's not a very nice picture in the sense that because it, it flips your mind. It either pops out of the uh, paper or it pops into the paper. Okay, but this is just a picture showing that you can make microstrip resonators and they can be uh, used as a filter in the sense that if I concatenate a number of LC tank circuits together, okay, one LC tank circuit has a resonance of this manner but if I concatenate three of them together, I can have a broadband uh, filter for my LC tank circuit. And you can also make uh, 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 filters using Fabry Perot resonator. We say that if you have a dielectric uh, slab, it can be made into a resonator as well because the wave can bounce back and forth. You can look for the transverse resonance condition and then at certain frequencies, this slab will start to resonate and you will have different kinds of uh, transmission coefficient for this. And you can use that as a filter because when it resonates, it becomes a good, uh, good way to transmit things from one side to the other side. And here is another example where you use cavity to build up strong electromagnetic field here. Okay. And then you inject the uh, electron beam inside this part of the cavity. And then uh, the, I guess the electron beam picks up uh, some energy from this first cavity and it transmits it to the other cavity. And then the microwave engineer uh, energy that you will have on the second cavity will become larger because of this effect, okay? You can also use cavity to make lasers. You probably have heard about lasers that if you get a medium to, to lace, it becomes an active medium. And if you make a resonator out of this thing by letting the wave bounce back and forth, uh, this active medium can become an amplifying medium. And it will make a 
very good rest meter out of this cavity and it will start to laze and give out uh, a laser light if you have an imperfect mirror at this end. Okay. And of course, I'm not going to tell you how lasers work. It works by energy transition in electronic levels in the thing. And also you can, you can make a semiconductor, a semiconductor laser diodes that laser at room temperature. For a long time, they couldn't make uh, laser diodes that laser at room temperature uh, because uh, you just don't get enough uh, what they call pop, uh, population inversion in the semiconductor laser to make it laze. However, if they start to make uh, waveguide structures out of this uh, laser structure, you can get the electromagnetic energy to be focused and concentrated around this region so it interacts with the uh, atoms inside there and you have population inversion you can get this structure to lace. So with good engineering you can do a lot of wonderful things. Here is just a microwave uh, wave meter. It used to is used to measure the frequency of a microwave. So you send microwave in from one end and then take microwave out and there's this kind of a coupling structure in there. I don't know if I have a picture of it. so Inside might look something like this. You send the microwave in at one end and then let the microwave come out at the other end. And then you can change the resonance frequency of this cavity by moving this rod back and forth. Okay. So if you happen to uh, hit the resonance frequency of the microwave, there would be quite a bit of trapping of the microwave energy in this cavity. And you will see that uh, the transmission of the microwave through this input and output will become smaller because of the wall losses you might have in this um, microwave cavity and so on. Okay, so there are lots of things you can make, and um, you can read the lecture notes. Uh, I'll fix up the lecture notes, and the last part of the course is heuristic because it's too difficult to analyze this kind of thing. There are no closed form solution, but if you have a lot of good physical insight. You can figure out how they work, okay? And you can also uh, figure out how these things work uh, using heuristics, how a laser works using heuristics and so on, how a klystron works, how a Fabry coral resonator works. I, I'll stop here. Are there any questions? Okay, um, if there are no questions, why don't we just stop here? Okay, I can hold an office hour at three o'clock this afternoon if you are interested for it. Okay, or maybe three o five. Give me give me a break. I take a short break and I'll come back to hold the office hour at three o five. Okay, talk to you later. Bye bye. Bye bye, professor. Okay, bye bye.